Hello and welcome to my documentary. Today I would like to talk about personal computers. Personal computers have been around for decades. Nowadays they can be simply built by hand at fairly reasonable prices. But years ago there was one company that knew how to make gaming computers and even personal normal business-like computers for cheap prices and made them one of the more dominant computer companies of their era. This is the story of Commodore International. The creator of Commodore would be known as Jack Trammell. Jack Trammell had a difficult childhood because he grew up in the years of World War II and he was Jewish. In 1939, he was transported to a ghetto in Lodz. Soon after, he was sent to Auschwitz, which was, is known as one of the worst concentration camps, if not the worst, in the history of World War II. He was liberated in April of 1945. In 1947, he moved to the United States where he joined the U.S. Army. This is where he began to learn about office equipment and repairing typewriters. Then in 1953, he bought a shop in the Bronx to repair office machinery. This began what would soon become Commodore. His first name for the company was the Commodore Portable Typewriter Company. He signed deals with many people and created typewriters in the 50s. The typewriters that he used were Czechoslovakian. In 1962, he went full public with Commodore. But Japanese typewriters came into the typewriter market and rendered his Czechoslovakian typewriters unprofitable. Soon after, Tremel realized that he would go bankrupt if he stayed with the typewriters. So then he moved on to digital calculators, changing Commodore's previous name to Commodore Business Machines Incorporated or CBM. They became one of the more popular calculator brands in the early 1970s, providing scientific and programmable calculators for numerous people. However, Texas Instruments in 1975 started putting out calculators that were cheaper than Commodore's calculators, and Texas Instruments supplied Commodore a lot of these calculator parts. Tremel saw this as a huge problem to his company so they bought their own chip line, known as Moss Technologies. And the chip designer at Moss Technologies said that he would join Commodore directly as head of engineering if Tremel would buy Moss. Tremel agreed and bought Moss Technologies and Chuck Peddle became head of engineering. Soon after this, Chuck Peddle would start design on Commodore's first computer. Chuck Peddle had taken over engineering at Commodore, and he convinced Jack Tramiel that calculators were already a dead end, and that they should turn their attention to home computers. Tramiel agreed, and before long, Peddle started work on Commodore's first computer. Commodore then relocated to Westchester, Pennsylvania, so they were closer to Moss Technologies. And then in 1977, Commodore released their first computer, known as the Commodore PET. PET stood for a Personal Electronic Transactor. There were two versions of the PET in the United States. The original one was the PET 2001 model. It had a rather small screen, a cassette tape drive built in, and a chiclet keyboard. The chiclet keyboard became very difficult to work with, with typing programs, typing up documents, or doing math on this computer. So this was not very well received by anybody. The computer is also made of metal so it could withstand a little bit more battering than say a plastic computer. The second model was the 4302 model. This had a normal keyboard which made it easier to type on, but the cassette drive was removed. These two computers both had a MOS 6502 CPU, which was a very standard CPU in all Commodore computers. Other computers would use CPUs similar to the MOS 6502 but maybe slightly different. 
the MOS 6502 CPU only ran at 1 MHz, which is very slow compared to today's CPUs, which run at a minimum of about 2.5 GHz. And the PET was not a conventional gaming computer. These were more for businesses or schools, such as typing up documents, doing math, doing homework. In 1980, this computer launched Commodore into being one of the three largest microcomputer companies and largest in the common market. However, Commodore lacked any kind of marketing strategy, such as Jack Trammell would set prices of the machines so that the prices would not be too high for the public consumer. Also when it came to home computing, this computer failed when compared to other computers at the time. Other computers had gotten more into the gaming market, while the pet lacked this peripheral. However, they changed this when they introduced the VIC-20 in 1981. This was Commodore's answer to appeal to everyone. It was very useful in the business and school standpoint where it could still do most of the stuff that the pet did, but also appeal to people at home where they could play games as well. And lots of people switched from video game consoles to computers because computers could do more than a console. And this computer also ran on the MOS 6502 CPU, such as the PET did. If you look at the VIC-20, it's got a keyboard on the front of it, a joystick port on the side, and several other ports on the back for the cartridges, floppy disks, and cassette drives. Its introductory price was $300. In 2019, this would be $836, which would be almost equivalent to gaming computers today. They also use aggressive advertisement on this computer. They even had William Shatner do a commercial of this computer. Why buy just a video game from Atari or in television? Invest in the wonder computer of the 1980s for under $300, the Commodore VIC-20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. With the Commodore VIC-20, the whole family can learn computing at home. Plays great games, too. Under $300, the wonder computer of the 1980s, the Commodore VIC-20. Coming soon, Commodore brings you Gorf, the wonder arcade game, and Omega Race in home versions, Commodore. Their strategies worked because the VIC-20 became the first computer to ship 1 million units, and at the end of the VIC-20's life, it shipped 2.5 million units. And by 1982, Commodore was ready to move on to their next computer. Thus, they created the Commodore 64. The 64 stood for 64 kilobytes of memory. And this is not the same as a Nintendo 64, which had 64 bits, not memory. This computer was by far a success because it was one of the most popular things on the market. It even survived the video game crash of 1983, which is brought about by an overblown video game market and an overblow of poorly designed games which almost killed the video game industry. Its price started out at $595 in 1982. This is significantly higher than the VIC-20, but much lower than any other 64 kilobyte machine at the time. In 2019, the Commodore 64's price would be $1,514, which is much higher in the gaming computer market today. Early Commodore 64 advertisements said, you can't buy a better computer at twice the price. Australian adverts in the mid-1980s used a tune saying the words, Are you keeping up with the If you look at the Commodore 64, it looks very similar to the VIC-20. It almost basically is. In fact, the keyboards can be interchangeable between some of the Commodore 64s and VIC-20s. However, on the back, some of the ports are slightly different as the cartridges were different sizes and the floppy drives were different between the two machines. And then in 1983, Trammell decided to focus on market share and cut the price of the VIC-20 and Commodore 64 dramatically. This would start what would be called the Home Computer War. Other companies like Texas Instruments, Apple, and Atari 
began cutting prices of their computers to try to keep up with Commodore. By the end of this price war, Commodore shipped somewhere around 22 million Commodore 64s, and this made the Commodore 64 the best-selling computer of all time. Things were looking really good for Commodore as they kept lowering and lowering the price of their computers. Some shops even sold the Commodore 64 for as low as $199. This was only $20 more than the Nintendo Entertainment System at the time. And the Commodore 64 could do more than the Nintendo Entertainment System, mainly because computers were more advanced than video game consoles at this time. Unfortunately, the next year, Commodore start running into troubles, and soon after, their death. Commodore's successful business would soon change course in the year 1984. In January of 1984, Trammell resigned due to intense disagreement with the chairman of the board, Irving Gold. So Gold replaced Trammell with Marshall F. Smith, a steel executive who had no experience with the computers or the consumer market. Trammell's resignation would hurt Commodore more than anyone could ever imagine. Commodore management then had to salvage the company's fortunes and plan for the future. It did so by buying a small startup company called Amiga Corporation in February of 1983 for $25 million. $12.8 million was paid in cash and $550,000 of the money was in common shares. And this became a subsidiary of Commodore called Commodore Amiga Incorporated. Commodore then tried releasing what would be their Amiga line of computers, which were 32-bit computers. A large increase from the VIC-20 and Commodore 64, which were both 8-bit. They released their first design in 1985. However, Jack Trammell beat his own company to the punch, where his design was 95% complete by June of 1984. And then in July of 1984, Trammell bought the consumer side of Atari Incorporated from Warner Communications, which allowed him to strike back at his former company, Commodore, and release the Atari ST earlier in 1985 for about $800 compared to the Commodore Amiga, which was $1,000. As time went on, more executives and researchers left Commodore after the announcement to join up with Trammell's new company, Atari Corporation. Commodore then followed by filing lawsuits against four former Commodore engineers for theft of trade secrets in late July. This was intended, in effect, to bar Trammell from releasing his new computer because the Atari ST and Amiga were very similar in how they worked and functioned. They both then went through several legal battles to bar the one company from releasing their computers. In the end, the Amiga computer outlasted the Atari. Throughout the life of the Atari ST and Amiga platforms, a ferocious Atari-Commodore rivalry raged. While this rivalry was in many ways a holdover from the days when Commodore had first challenged Atari and others in a series of scathing television commercials, and the events leading to the launch of the Atari ST and Amiga only served to further alienate fans of each computer who fought heavily holy wars on the question of which platform was superior. However, these battles were in vain as neither platform captured a significant share of the world computer market and only the Apple Macintosh would survive the industry-wide shift to Microsoft Windows running on PC clones. Pretty soon Commodore is being beaten out by the IBM PCs and other Apple Macintosh computers. Commodore's marketing efforts for the Amiga computers were less successful in breaking the new computers into this now established market than its promotions for their 8-bit line of computers that had been making Commodore the home computer leader. They would then try making home video game consoles such as the Commodore CD TV, Commodore Dynamic Total Vision, and the Amiga CD32. Not much is known on these two systems because they are both commercial and financial failures that doomed the company, but I can give you a little rundown on what these two were like. The CD-TV was essentially a Commodore Amiga 500 computer with a CD-ROM drive and a remote control. 
One of the most infamous games for the CD TV was The Town With No Name, which is regarded as being one of the worst video games in existence, and would spell Doom for the CD TV, with other games following along its line, and people calling it a fiasco for Commodore. The Amiga CD32 was released in 1993, and was quote, the make or break system for Commodore. It claimed to be the world's first 32-bit CD-based home console. Even with all its aggressive advertisement and strategies to try to win over players from the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, it ultimately failed to get any public consumers. Another notorious game that was made for the CD32 was Kang Fu, which is a game about a kangaroo action-adventure platformer that was designed very poorly and swiftly to try to get games out for the CD32 to get public interest into the system. Unfortunately, the CD32 was discontinued in less than a year in April of 1994 as Commodore filed for bankruptcy and went out of business. It is sad to see Commodore be reduced to practically nothing nowadays. However, there is still a loyal following for the company, especially the Commodore 64. On October 9, 2018, Jesse Wade of Retro Games released the C64 Mini. This device was a hardware clone of the original Commodore 64. It came with over 60 games that were all created for the Commodore 64, and it even contains the original code that the Commodore 64 had, so you could type your own little programs and have fun with the device in general. Sadly, Commodore may have died, but their legacy still lives on. This has been my documentary. Thanks for watching.